lines to move in different directions. So, and, but this is partly also happening without the externally applied field. So iron transport is pretty complicated to, to describe. I have one, well, what we do today is using an equation called the Nance-Planck equation, where you have three terms, or maybe four sometimes. The first one is the pure, simple diffusion term, where the concentration gradient is governing the diffusive part of the ion transport. The second term here, you have the concentration and you have the electrical field. And the electrical field could be the electrical field that you applied, but it could also be the electrical field created by the other ions. So describing the ion transport, you need to quantify the elect electrical field in your system as well. And if you then also have a, a movement of the pore liquid, you would get the convective part. So ions will move because the pore solution is moving. If you have drying, for instance, or wetting. So it very easily turns out to be fairly complicated. I have one example here, what happens during a test like the one you saw yesterday, where you apply an electrical field over a specimen. You have here, in this case, you have a slice of concrete, you have an upstream cell, and you have a downstream cell. In the downstream cell, you have no chlorides. In the upstream cell, you have chlorides. And if you apply an electrical field here, chlorides will move inwards, and after a certain time, they have reached this level. At the same time, the positive ions have moved in the other direction. So after a certain time, you will have a very complicated profile of all the species included here. And here we included chloride, sodium, potassium, and hydroxides. And this is not e easy to understand. What actually happened during this process? I, I, for a long time, I had, didn't have time simply to understand what is actually happening here. I had a student working on this, and I couldn't understand what, if his results were really true or not. Because you need to understand what is actually happening here. It took me a, a four month sabbatical to have time to penetrate what is actually happening here. And I think I understood it by then. I don't know if I understand it today, but I, I have understood it sometime. This is here. Th these are the concentrations we had initially in the concrete. You know, we have a lot of alkalis in, in cementitious materials. So here, no chloride, some sodium, some potassium, and of course a lot of hydroxides. That is the initial concentration. But this has now been changed. And you have to have a charge balance in, in your system in every point, at every depth. So that is behind what is actually happening during this process, where some things is, are moving in here and some other things are moving out. Okay, then I would like to end with talking about moisture transport. And moisture transport, what is happening? Okay, sorry? Okay. Okay, moisture transport. A popular way to describe moisture transport mechanisms is this way. We're talking about vapor transport, and we're talking about liquid transport. Vapor transport would be due to concentration differences of vapor. Liquid transport would be due to 
surface tension creating menisci and a negative pore water pressure. And pore water pressure differences would suck water through your pore system. That is the two main mechanisms in a traditional way to describe moisture transport. I doubt if that is true in cementitious materials because in cementitious materials with a very low water cement ratio we have very little liquid and we have very little vapor but we have a lot of water in the gel and I, I doubt if that water is actually liquid or vapor. So we have something else. We do not have any moisture con convection in cementitious materials, meaning that moisture is moving with air going through. That is not relevant for cementitious materials. Let me see here. Okay, I didn't have it here. Okay. So we have to look into one mechanism that is not well described and not well understood and that is the transport of the water in the gel. You could call it sorbed water, adsorbed water or whatever, but we need to have a way to understand how it's transported and, and why. The way we do deal with this is to describe the diffusive part, fairly simple, with vapor content or vapor pressure as the transport potential. We have different fav favorites in different countries. I think Sweden is the only one using the vapor content. Most other countries in Europe are using the vapor pressure. As a, Even in Denmark you're using the vapor pressure as a, the driving force for vapor diffusion. Uh, but this is not important as, as long as you, you know what you're doing. When it comes to moisture flow, we should describe moisture flow with the pressure, uh, pressure, pore water pressure as the driving force of the transport potential because it's sucking of water. And then we should have a description like this where we have a permeability and the viscosity of the, of the liquid being water. You would have a, an equation like this. And if you have the pore, with one meniscus here and another one here. If this is more curved, you will have a lower pressure here, a larger negative pressure, sucking water this way. So because of the curvature here, you will have a difference in, in pore water pressure. And a simple way to deal with this is to simply sum up these two. Add the vapor concentration uh, or the vapor diffusion with the liquid transport and try to see if you can split it up or you did, if you need to split it up. And if you, as long as you have no temperature gradient, it's fairly simple. So if you have a no temperature gradient, you have this equation that Mette showed. The pore water pressure, you talked about the Kelvin radius and so on. You can go from a vapor pressure to a pore pressure and back again. So you can describe the pore pressure in terms of the vapor concentration or the relative humidity. And that means that you can change this one, the pore water pressure, into vapor pressure. And this is correct as long as you do not have a temperature gradient. And that means that you end up with a fairly simple equation here with only one transport potential summing up all the transport property in one transport property. Of course that is not a constant, it's moisture dependent but it includes all the moisture transport. Sometimes you see this equation instead. You have here, as the transport potential, you have the total content of water in your, in your system. And there is no reason to believe why that should be a transport potential. 
but it's easy to measure. Should we use it because it's easy to measure? See, if there is no physics behind it, I don't think so. I did it myself in my thesis, but it was a long time ago, so I hope I'm excused. But maybe you should come up with something different. This is a simple way to deal with it. It could be done if you are only looking into drying, for instance. But if you're looking into drying and wetting, it's not possible. If you're comparing different materials, it's not possible. If you have a material where you have different degrees of hydration at different depths, it wouldn't hold. So then you should come up with something else. But it's, it's simple. You can find simple mathematics around such an equation, but I don't think it's, it's very, very um, nice. Try to get something else. I have uh, noted the drawbacks here. You can, uh, some of you are dealing with hysteresis, for instance. And if you're dealing with hysteresis, you could get moisture to get to be transported in the opposite direction to this equation. So it's, it's not very nice at all. Try to avoid it. But what about the, the water in the gel? How should we describe transport of water in the gel, which is not any li uh, liquid and which is not a vapor? But it is transported. Well, it's, it's simple if you do not have any temperature gradient then you can pick anything, because everything will point in the same direction. But if you want to get close to the mechanisms, you have a tough time, because we don't know the mechanism. It's reasonable, reason to, uh, it's reasonably to, to, uh, reasonable to assume that the mechanism would include the, the water activity differences here. So if you have a higher water activity here than here, you should have a transport this way. And the water activity could be uh, described with the relative humidity. That is a very good measure of the water activity. And that is what we're doing, actually. But is it salt water transport? You know, that, this happens in wood as well. And in wood, they call it bound water transport. And the cell wall in wood it's a bundle of molecules where you have moisture transport in between. Not as vapor, not as liquid, but a moisture transport. And it's, I, I, I look upon transport in the gel as very similar to this kind of transport process. It's a pro proposal for a, a transport equation for, for this kind of transport with the relative humidity as the transport potential. Well, these transport properties are certainly not transport, uh, are certainly not constants. And this is just a schematic uh, picture of a, a one pore with different humidities from a very dry pore with no adsorbate to a very wet pore with menisci like this. And increasing the humidity, you have more and more liquid in such a pore. And this is the traditional way of looking into moisture transport. Of course, you will have a larger and larger moisture flow. The, the more humid your material is and the higher the relative humidity is. And it could look like this if you measure it. The dotted curve here. If you measure it as a function of relative, relative humidity, you would see something like this. And if you try to split this up, the total moisture flow, into something you would call a vapor diffusion and something you would call a liquid flow, the traditional way to do that is to say, well, the vapor flow will be smaller and smaller the more water there is in the pore system because the vapor cannot get through. And the liquid flow will not happen beneath a certain humidity because there is no path of liquids. But above that limit, the liquid flow will increase very much with the humidity. But I think we need something else if we want to describe what actually is happening 
we might be able to, we might have to describe something called, well, not, maybe not bound water, but absorbed water flow. And I would assume that that would increase with humidity. That is what happens in wood. And the wetter the gel is, the more easy should it be to get water through. So you should end up with something like this. And maybe for some cementation material where you have a lot of capillary pores and a large capillary network, you could have a liquid flow through that network like this, ending up with the same total transport property. For applications, we can live with not knowing this as long as we do not have any temperature gradients and as long as we do not, uh, do not uh, interest ourselves for ion transport. If we do, we need to, to know what portion of this water or this moisture flow can carry the ions and what portions cannot. That is a decisive property that we need to know when dealing with ion transport. Okay, I think this is my last picture. Yes, it is. This is just one example of moisture transport into a very good concrete with a low water cement ratio. The water binder ratio is here 0.4. These specimens have been exposed to seawater for two years. What is happening then if you expose a concrete to seawater for two years? Such a good concrete has a, a significant self-desiccation. Meta talked about that this morning. The, the uh, binder reactions will give a, a volume change, emptying part of the pore system. And here we could measure that as a drop in relative humidity from 100% down to 85, and a drop in degree of saturation to this level. So we have a significant self-desiccation. Partly empty pore system. Then we expose it to water for two years. And you can see the penetration process here being very slow. After two years, we have a penetration of water about something like 20 millimeters. That's it. And so far, we haven't been able to describe this penetration process. Because if we measure the properties of the same concrete, the sorption isotherm and the moisture transport properties, and try to simulate this, we should have a saturated system much earlier. But this is what we measure, something we do not understand. Could be, could be a densification of the surface here that is constantly in contact with water further con uh, densification of that surface. Not necessarily because of things available in the, in the seawater, but maybe of the binder reactions continuing and densifying the system. We don't know, that's something for you. Could you call this capillary suction? A specimen in contact with water, that's what you usually call a capillary suction experiment. But it doesn't look like capillary suction to me. I don't think there are any capillaries. So I, I call it moisture transport, not n uh, mentioning the mechanism involved. OK, summing up, transport processes are significant and decisive for a lot of deterioration processes. The transport processes, all, almost all of them, are significantly dependent on the moisture conditions. Uh, to describe a transport pro process and to understand it, you need to understand also the interaction with the matrix, the binding or whatever you call it, and uh, to be able to go further than we are today, not only measuring on microscopic scale, you need to understand what is actually happening. And if we want to go on, later on to make predictions, we need pretty sophisticated models.
yeah, i think that's for now. now it's coffee break.